Um, so we're going to be talking about social capital and what that really means. And I'm going to do a real quick introduction here. We have Brian Newman, we have Emily Best, we have John Reese. I will leave them to give their little um, CV uh, uh, in terms of their background. But I'm going to throw it to Emily first because she just told me that she can actually tell me when social capital ap first appeared in use. In, you know, and because uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a fairly new concept. No, so, so this is really interesting. I, I just want to give a little bit of history about why we ended up doing this panel. And that was at the LA Film Festival this year, um, Dana participated in something we ran called the Innovator Summit. And the Innovator Summit was take, bringing together people from all across the industry, filmmakers, distributors, financiers, platform, um, all sorts of journalists, um, to talk about the big uncertainties in the future of film. And one of the things that I thought was most interesting was that um, a major theme that emerged from this room of experts who spent seven hours in a room together sort of discussing these um, in a structured brainstorm was that social capital would emerge as one of the um, most powerful tools that filmmakers would have going forward. And I was like, well, this bears some examination. So um, I did some research, and it turns out that social capital was first uh, written about by a this is going to be really boring, just really quickly, by a, a West Virginian uh, school administrator named L.J. Hannafin. It appears in 1916, interestingly enough. You're making this up. No, I'm not. I swear. West Virginian school administrators, not, I'm not clever enough to come up with something like that. Um, and he wrote about it as goodwill, uh, fellowship, and cooperation, such, and the, the, the greater amount of social capital in a community, um, the better for each of the community's members, right? So that's a very sort of basic definition. What's interesting about social capital and the way that it's come to be used is it gets conflated with human capital or it gets conflated with you know, political capital. But if you think about what capital is altogether, and I hope we won't get into a debate about that because that's boring, um, it's something that you get that you can use to get more stuff. Right? or more things, or more influence. Um, and I think the, the more common understanding of social capital now is it's, um, it, it is a, a tangible, a, a word about a tangible thing that is actually describing the measurement of something that is not tangible, um, which has to do with trust, uh, reputation, influence, people's desire to impress you, people's desire to help you, um, and uh, ways that you can sort of accrue social capital um, are things that this panel um, has a lot to say about. So that's yeah. And to that. and to put it into further perspective in terms of filmmaking, um, the idea that we kind of, that we discussed uh, at the LA Film Festival was that social capital is an essential element now of being a filmmaker. There's no real way to be an independent filmmaker without it. It's, um, I mean, obviously making um, any film, uh, much less you know, independent film, is a uh, effort of a group of people. But the amount of trust that's required, not just to get the film made, but to get the film seen, um, it becomes an essential element. But it, what I want to talk about is what social capital really breaks down to. I was talking about this with a friend earlier today. And he said, well, yeah, how do you quantify this? And I was thinking, God, wouldn't it be amazing if someday we all have bank accounts and where you can actually measure your capital the way that you can if you check your Wells Fargo account and you can see exactly where you, you, know, where you stand and how much you need and what you, could, you, know, what you don't have enough of. I mean, that's what things like clout and things are doing, but it's a very clumsy method right now. I mean, to, uh, I was just saying backstage that, you know, to me, clout is about as effective as looking at the big piles of money of Scrooge McDuck. It's like it doesn't really tell you what you have or what you can do with it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. What is, what are the elements of social capital? If we're, to, you know, if we're going to break it down into um, currency, you know, what, what's a dollar? What's a quarter? What's a hundred dollars? What do you know, how, how do we, how do we figure out what, you know, how do we, you know, make that equivalency? John? Okay. Oh. Um, well, that's really hard to say. I just, into more specifics is like, well, like email lists, are $20 bills and Twitter followers would be dimes and you know Facebook likes would be 50 cents or a dollar 
you know, I guess you could look at it that way, you know, um, and just look at the effectiveness of each strand of social capital and what that potentially results in. You know, to me, the, the biggest thing is, you know, maintaining that connection because you can have an email list of 6,000 people, but if you don't maintain it and it doesn't, you don't work it and develop that relationship with the people, which is very hard, if not impossible, to quantify, I would say, um, it doesn't mean anything. So you can have as many Twitter followers, et cetera, it doesn't mean anything unless you build something and establish that relationship. Um, and I guess you were asking you know, about my Kickstarter campaign, and that's what I really found is that you know, you know, I'm okay at that development, but you really have to, it really was instructive for me that you know, I have to regularize my, even myself realizing that you know, my email list has to be, I have to up my email list and what I do for my email list and what I do for people and, and well, what, I. Yeah, what do you do for your email list? I mean, what does that, right. what does that I mean, how, what, is the, what is the care and feeding of an email list? What does that mean? Always providing value. Like if I would say one thing, one takeaway from this panel would be, you know, 90% of what you do or 95% of what you do in reaching out or in communicating should be about helping everyone else around you. And then, you know, and then occasionally there's an ask, but only occasionally or a self-promotion. But no one's gonna listen to that self-promotion unless you're showing that you're providing something and giving value to other people. So for instance, I would just follow, I think Tiffany Schlein does an amazing job with her email list. Like if you wanna see social capital, and I just talked to her about this recently, um, you know, and she spends a lot of time developing those email blasts. Like she works it. Like it, right? What? Yes, I think it's called it. Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah, and then I would just subscribe to her email list and see those emails and what she does. And she'll eventually talk about her film, but she has a whole list of opportunities for filmmakers on there. She, she discusses different things that are going on that are relevant to her audience that her audience wants to know. So for instance, whenever I do an email blast, I put like a blog post in there or talk about something about distribution and marketing. And I was just talking to my assistant that we have to, you know, I say, look at Tiffany's, we have to approximate this. We need more research to go into it. We have to provide more value you know, and do it regular, and that's the other thing, and I'll, then I'll shut up, is that, you know, the other thing about social capital is you have to be consistent. You can't go away, you know, and that's a little bit of a freak out for filmmakers because, you know, occasionally you, you have to go away to, you know, to- To make a movie. Hibernate, what? To make a movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you need to incorporate, the making of the movie is not so difficult, but like conceptualizing and sometimes artists need to hibernate in some way, but don't hibernate for too long and try to find someone else to pick up the slack somehow so that if you can, essentially the other thing is if you can't do this, find someone on your team who can help you do this. So, so th there's sort of two elements of social capital that are really important to distinguish from like dollar dollar bills. Um, and the first is, to your point, it depreciates very quickly. So once you earn it, you write that funny tweet and you get a few more followers. If you don't follow that up with more funny tweets, they don't care about you and like the next time they call their list, they just unfollow you, right? So the maintenance piece is really important because it's not something you can accrue um, by sort of a singular action. Um, unless you're talking about sort of less scalable versions of social capital where like, I did you a huge favor and like for a while you're gonna owe me. Because over time, the accrual becomes trust. And once you reach the trust apex, which is definitely what Tiffany has done, she is a trusted source of information about innovation, filmmaking, connectivity. Um, and so she has a certain sort of top level, like I could not hear anything from Tiffany Schlein for six years and the next time she says something, I'm like, I'm listening. So one is the depreciation factor um, and building trust. And the, the second piece is um, unlike actual capital, which is a little bit more fixed, except when they print tons of money, um, which is that like if you have a bunch of money, that's probably money that somebody else doesn't have. Social capital works quite the opposite, which is everyone is enriched the more social capital everyone has. And in fact, the best ways to earn social capital, as John was pointing out, are ways in which you are providing opportunities for your community members to earn more social capital among their friends. So you post an interesting article that they can then talk about at a party and sound smart. That's them earning social capital in their community. And that earns you more social capital because you made them look good. And actually, that is 
and this is my sort of, this is the, my soapbox, is that um, an economy of social capital is one in, of a culture of plenty, as opposed to the culture of scarcity that we're all used to operating in. There's not enough distribution opportunities. There's not enough funding for film. There's not enough audience. Um, I don't believe any of those things are true if we are focused on generating social capital in our communities. And a, in a great example of this were the star Kickstarters lately that people, there's a lot of backlash about, like Zach Braff and maybe Spike Lee and everyone saying, oh, those are awful because they're taking away money from us independent filmmakers. And that's not true. They're bringing more people in to the community and they're making the pot bigger and getting people used to crowdfunding. And, and also because those people, by the fact that they're celebrity to some degree, have a good deal of social capital. Not just, you know, they, they come to the table with that. In fact, um, and by contrast, we just had an um, interesting experience with, I don't know if you guys saw the Kickstarter piece about the woman who was looking for $5 million for the film that was kind of badly defined and there was no video and there was just a photo of her. It was a real, and if you build it, they will come. No, they won't. And um, uh, for anything. But, uh, but for, and it was really interesting though because I thought about such a backlash is she came with no social capital. She just kind of came with her hand out and saying, give me, give me five million and I have a letter of interest from Heather Matarazzo. And that doesn't really, you know, that, that doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us anything about, and there's nothing about the film. It looks like she hasn't put effort into it, and it's a huge ask. And so there's not the kind of, you know, the give take. And she didn't give anything of value. At the end of the day, not only does she not have social capital, part of social capital is giving back value to other people. And while it's somewhat of a libertarian notion, which I don't describe to overall, people tend to only do things when it helps them somehow as well. And one of the reasons people give to Kickstarter is because they're getting something out of it, whether that something is supporting you or getting a DVD or a cool sticker. It's helping enrich their lives as well. So what this allows to happen is something where it's more like Lewis Hines' The Gift, where it's something where it's an ongoing gift. And if you don't offer that, which she didn't, you know, it was very much about her and it was very rigid and not offering a lot. And Spike Lee learned from that as well. I mean, that was one of the biggest critiques of him is was he wasn't giving enough back and he started to change that in response to the crowd. So I think it's learning that you have to give something of value for people to give something of value to you. So and, um, Brian, tell us a little bit about what, you know, what your experience has been with social capital in terms of the films that you've been consulting on. Well, to step back to the original thing as well about social capital, to me, social capital is power. And it's always been part of the film industry. But the fact of the matter was, up until a certain point in time, the social capital was if you looked like me, if you were a white guy and you went to an elite school, you had a lot of social capital with a lot of other rich people who would help you make your rich film. And you were able to afford to move film print cans that weigh tons around the country. And you were able to meet the distributors who only hang out at Sundance because they don't go to your small town festival. And so your social capital was limited by certain strictures. And what digital has done pretty well is blow apart a lot of walls that kept apart us having access to more social capital. And so now people have the ability to connect with a much wider range of people of all social strata and all ability to help you on your film. And you're able to use and build up your social connections to break down those walls and get movies made that couldn't get made before because you didn't have access to the other white guys making the decisions that look like me in all those places. And now you can. So that's the first part of it that I think is really crucial to understand is that it's really changed some fundamental dynamics, at least for the short term, power has a way of accruing itself back to the people in power at some point. But for now, it's gotten an opportunity where a filmmaker can connect directly to their audience without having to have Sony Classics say, okay, this is a film we'll take out. You can build something that, that goes broader. So that's just from a philosophical point what I like about it. In terms of people I've worked with, um, I've worked on a lot of filmmakers building campaigns to raise money for their films, both through crowdfunding and through traditional fundraising. And at the end of the day, the ones that are successful are the ones that are building relationships, and that leads to the funding. So whether it's, you know, all these people who send in grants to the old-fashioned grant givers, if you didn't know the program officer before you sent in your grant, you're probably not going to get funded. There's a few people from the slush pile who get funded, but it's really about building that relationship with a program officer. And the same thing today, when you're building your relationship with your fan base for a Kickstarter campaign or Indiegogo or whoever you like to use, it's about building a relationship, an ongoing relationship, and the people that I've worked with that have been successful have treated it like a relationship where they have an ongoing dialogue with their fans and they give them something of value on an ongoing basis. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I think a sort of misconception of crowdfunding up until now, or I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of, now that it's been around for a few years, like best practices are emerging and it's getting better and more fine-tuned all the time. But um, launching a crowdfunding campaign is exactly like starting a social media account. Um, you are beginning an audience engagement, which if you go silent, you might as well just shut the account down. It doesn't matter. Um, so it used to be treated as a stopgap funding method, and more and more you see that people are engaging it as a style of producing. That yes, I'm going to put in place some traditional financing, but of course I'm going to do some crowdfunding because part of what I'm doing is offering my audience an opportunity to get involved uh, on the ground level, and when that is most successful. I mean, on Seed and Spark, um, we've, we've been incredibly um, lucky and fortunate where we've had 69% success rate with our crowdfunding campaigns. And that's because what we screen for is, do you have a well-articulated argument for why this matters? And not just why, not, I, I, I'm not, we never ask them to articulate why it matters to someone else. Why does it matter to you? And that's really personal, and it's really authentic. And frankly, you know, we spend, we get to spend a lot of time meeting, how many of you in here are filmmakers? Is it most of the crowd? Awesome. Okay, so I feel like the luckiest person on earth to get into some of these industry speed dating things because we just meet one after another incredibly smart, incredibly passionate, really creative person who's really driven not by money, not by fame, but because they have something to say that really matters to them. And that is what is very effective in this social capital building space. Because if you can clearly articulate why it matters to you, um, that gets people excited. And they start to think about what matters to them. And that's when they start to acquire sort of their own social capital thanks to the risks that you're taking. Um, and that's been an amazing, I'm gonna use the B word, brand building um, opportunity for filmmakers because it used to be that nobody ever knew your name. They knew the title of your movie maybe, they knew the actors in your movie, but nobody really knew who you were. With crowdfunding now, they build a relationship directly with you as if you were a musician, you know, in a band. And they know the band name. And that way, you release your first album and it does a little bit, and then you release your next album and you get to build on the audience of the first album as opposed to starting over from zero like we've been doing for so many years from film to film. And that's where sort of the concept of social capital, I think, is becoming more and more essential in our, in our work. How long, do, how long do you think it takes to build social capital? To build, it's like, you know, it's like how, basically how patient do people need to be and how, um, how much work do they need to put in before they can expect to see results? Wow, I always get the fun questions. Um, <laughs> uh, it takes time. It's it's work. You know, I kind of like started developing the my my alt non filmmaker brand when the book came out or before the book came out four years ago. You know, I still remember Ted saying, you know, don't just work on your book. You have to like build your audience before the book gets out. But I'm writing my book. You know, and um, so it was like a little bit. It's you know it took like a, I would say a year to two years. I mean, just, I mean, I started four years ago with that brand. I have 10,000 Twitter followers now, you know, and it, it gets, one thing I say is it does get easier as you start when people see like the, I've seen the speed since I passed 7,000, it's faster getting up to 10,000 and now I'm already almost at 11,000. It starts, the work, the groundwork is the hardest. And that's, I think, and it's also the most frustrating because it's like you feel like you're not getting anywhere. But there's pretty tried and true techniques about how to start doing it now, like, you know, adding other people who are influencers, you know, you know, having so you know, going into a conversation, listening first, starting to engage, you know, posting on other places, retweeting people. There's like, and I believe this is written about, like now it's a little bit easier because you can start getting into a community. Um, you know, and but it takes it takes some time. That's why you have to start early, and you have to think about your brand over time. And the thing is about brand is it's about what's authentically you. And the easiest thing to write about is what interests you and people. And then you'll start attracting people who are interested in what's interesting to you. 
and then those that will become your audience so long as you communicate it and use certain social media techniques in order to put that out there you'll start attracting people who are interested in you and it will feel and it will start it will be fun you know even i'm not that social of a person you lies know. that's a lie by the way <laughs> no really i'm not that social of a person to be honest and it is work for me to do this, but when I do it, it's rewarding. It's like I, someone from Canberra in Australia tweets me back or invites me to something or, or says, what do you think about this? Or I just saw you at a restaurant the other day and it's, you know, that was a little odd, but, um, <laughs> but um, you know, but it's really rewarding because it's, if you keep it authentic, it's, going to be about you and you're creating more friends and the thing is you the biggest thing I would the other big takeaway is you again get out of that project to project think about how your films and your work connects over time and they're basically going to connect to your vision and, and your growth and your growth and write about the experience and just little things about the experience and what excites you. I love Instagram because, and I think film, Instagram is like the, the filmmaker's social media because it's like I'm a visual person, I see something on the street, I take a picture, write a little thing about it, and you know, that's the most fun social network. But I also send it to you know, Twitter and Facebook, and I, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering your question. I think what's it's really interesting about something you said is I've been trying to make an argument that I'm sort of uniquely unqualified to make. I'm going to call some nerds out in the audience. How many of you know what the Fibonacci golden spiral is? <laughs> yes! Okay. So for those of you who don't, it's a, it is an... Uh, it is an exponential spiral that is very, it's a golden spiral because it sort of, um, it grows in a, in a uniform way outward, but it gets big really fast. And the center of the spiral is the sort of on the ground work that you do in building social capital. It's showing up to these things, it's networking, it's shaking hands, starting a Twitter account, starting a Facebook feed, posting stuff that's valuable, and building, starting to build trust in a community. And just like you said, I think it's so interesting, then you hit a point where it's tipped from interest to trust, and all of a sudden you start to see it spin outwards really fast. It used to be, in, the, in, this, in what you described so astutely, it used to be a closed good old boys virtuous circle. They just, you scratch your back, I scratch my back. You scratch your back, I scratch my back. In the new digital age, we have this Fibonacci golden spiral possibility, and anybody can do it. The barrier of entry is zero. Right, but what I feel is that, um for that old paradigm. It used to be that to get your film made, you had to, quite frankly, come here to IFP and go to the market and pitch, and you had to go to Sundance and start building connections with financiers and people to greenlight your film. And as Peter Broderick probably has said in one of his panels here, now the real power is to greenlight your own film. And where that comes from is that direct connection to your fan. So I would actually argue what everyone should be doing right now is being at home building short form content they're putting online and building a direct connection to their fan instead of coming and listening to us. Because yeah, what are you guys go doing home, here? just because go Because yeah. if you spend that, I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, it's really hard to be a creative person and get things made. And it's hard work. And it's always been hard work. And so every time you hear that overnight sensation, even back in the past, they actually did a lot of stuff getting to where they got building up in the old system. Well, now it's the same thing. It takes a lot of time to build up your audience of fans. But if you're the person who's constantly, like Freddie Wong, posting short form video and building up an army where you've got four million people on average watching your episodes, that's, a, that's more people than Mad Men. And that person can now go out and do a crowdfunding campaign because they've built that direct connection to their fans instead of to the head of Focus Features. And so you can now green light your film by building a connection to your fan. And if you're an outgoing enough person to do that, that's what you should be doing today is focusing on that instead of the old system. Well, I mean, to kind of to counter some of that, it's like I, it seems to me that it's like you're kind of obliged to do both. You are obliged to stay home and to do the tweets and the Facebook and the, you know, the Vines or whatever else it is that you do to, make, to connect with people. But ultimately, it's about connection. It's about making connections with people. And, yeah, I mean, and, and, and there has to be there has to be some I, real life element to it as well. And I totally agree with Brian, but I do agree that going out like I'm a big believer in events and being out in person and I think the trust like I'm passing around my email list, like I'll I don't know what I'll get maybe 
if you're, I'm lucky, 50 to 100 emails, to get that online is so difficult because they don't, you're just like a faceless entity. But if you're out meeting people and gathering cards and, and that's a way to like, you know, because that's still one-to-one, face-to-face way of meeting people is still hugely valuable. So I'd say, I agree with Dana, I think you have to do a little bit of both. But you do have to find a way to create regularized content that I think the one thing is to, that filmmakers have to get away from is, you know, going away for five years to make a film, you have a film, you try to bring it to the market, and then go away for five years. That model is, that is totally, that's broken. Like, that's totally broken. I'm being hyperbolic, and I wouldn't be here if I didn't value meeting people at IFP, obviously. (laughs) That's my day job is, buying movies and we're still meeting people face to face to establish a relationship. But at the same time, I can argue that going back to Freddie Wong or any one of those types of people, you know, they're not here at this conference. They've built a direct relationship to their fan and now people are begging them to make content for them, whether it's advertisers or studios. And they haven't worked the system. They've worked the new system completely. Yeah, I think and, it's and you know, and right now, if you're the organizer of a conference trying to get one of them to show up on your panel, they don't even see your email because they get 400,000 of them from all their fans every day and yours doesn't stick out. So there is a little bit of both, but there's a whole new era to embrace. And while you should do both, I think enough, what I fear is that a lot of really great indie filmmakers that I know aren't embracing the new stuff they can do enough and are still focused on the old ways of doing things. I totally agree. And you can build an audience so much easier now and turn that into something that's good for you long term. And it's, it actually changes the way that you create. I mean, I think that's a really important point is that If you are in a direct-to-fan universe and what you want to do is build a direct relationship with the audience, there's two things that are really um, important to learn from um, really successful YouTubers. One, first of all, I found this out from uh, a friend of mine who's an exec at at Maker Studios. Um, There is a 90 to 10 or 9 to 1, rather, conversion rate on videos that are introduced by the um, by the creators versus not. So when they just come on and they're like, hey guys, what's up, hope you like my movie, which I don't know if any of you have seen the previews to Don John. Do you know that, um, that uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt comes on and he's like, hey guys, I made this movie and I really hope you like it. And then they show the trailer and you're like, oh. But it's actually, it's adorable, you know, because he's like, he says something really genuine, which is like, I did this thing, I'm really proud of it, and I hope you like it. And that actually has an, a tremendously higher conversion rate online um, than other videos. What does that say? At the very least, the millennials, and these are the people who are going to be buying movies for the next 60 years, um, they want to know you. They want to see your face. Um, They want to know who's behind the stuff that they make. And if you're going to behave in that environment, it can't just be about the, I'm I'm gonna poke your transmedia bug right now. It can't just be about the single film that you're making, but there has to be a lot of other ancillary content that you're using to continue to generate this, um, these audiences and to continue to stoke their interest. Um, but the reason Joseph Gordon-Levitt is able to do that, I think, and I don't think you'll disagree, I mean, is that it's not just that he showed up and he's a famous guy and shows up, it's that he's been taking that time, aside from his Hollywood career, yeah. he's been taking, what, five years now to build up Hit Record Joe and his direct to fan You guys got a, who, so, knows hit reco- who knows the site Hit Record? Huh. Everyone who didn't raise their hands, go home and take a look at Hit Record and see what he's doing and forget Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Just look at that platform, and that is a brilliant audience engagement platform. And it's like a new model of making films. Also, who knows Tiffany Schlein's Cloud Filmmaking Manifesto? Oh, one. Every, the other 98% of you in here, that's the other thing, that's another thing you should go home. And who knows the free YouTube um, partner guide that's online as a PDF? How many people know that that exists? Okay, the other 97% go home and Google YouTube Partner Guide PDF. It'll come up, it's in version three now. It's like a huge book and it's stocked with tips of how to help your films get adopted and seen. And also, if you're not familiar, I I don't wanna just sort of like assume that everyone knows how to optimize Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and all of those things. Um, on the Seed and Spark website, uh, on the, we have a blog called Bright Ideas, and right up at the top, there's um, two little two-page social media guides where if you don't, 
if, if you're like, ah, but Twitter and the hashtags and the stuff, it is a super, super simple way to start engaging on Twitter successfully, like tomorrow. Um, and those are great resources. One other thing I would uh, ask you to read if you didn't either see it at Toronto or read their transcript already, you guys published it. Um, Dan Kogan's uh, speech about the, the new relationship between the investor and the filmmaker, um, sort of similar to the gift model, but it is really talking about um, respecting your craft as a, as a gift that you're giving to the community um, and, and being really confident that that is a powerful offering that you're making. And that's part of the confidence of an audience building, because obviously if you're building an audience, it's because you think people should watch your stuff, right? So I think we have like a little more than five minutes left. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Who is the name of the Twitter guy you mentioned? Uh, it's um, on the Seed and Spark website. There's a blog called Bright Ideas. Right at the top, it says Social Media Handbooks, Part One and Two. They're each two pages. And if you need, like, a, I thought a good book for coaching, you know, just it's like this shouting at you, go do it. Social media is this kind of a little bit obnoxious book called Crush It. And it's just like, go do it, you can do it. It's about media and like, this is how you do it. It's really short and it's just like really positive, you know, in a way that you need to if you're just getting into it. Probably bears mentioning, there's a gentleman over here, John Tregonis, who wrote a really great book called Crowdfunding for Filmmakers. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of guide and he's sporting his company colors, he's now the um, advisor for film and music. Uh, video. And video, sorry, film and video at Indiegogo. It's, anyway. on, it's on IndieWire. Yeah. Yeah. We published it. Crush it. So it. Can you talk briefly about family and friends in building your social capital and how you utilize that for your creative That's where it starts. <laughs> so part of the reason that um, it's really important, uh, they say, I, I, think that, I think the statistic is still if you raise the first 20% of your crowdfunding campaign in the first seven days, you're something like 80% likely to succeed. Um, why is that? Because that first 20%, if you look at any platform, is pretty much entirely people you know. And strangers need to know that you're not a creep. And the way that they know that you're not a creep is that your friends and family who would know if you're a creep have already put their money in. I'm serious. It's like you need that immediate circle social validation. So if you're starting a crowdfunding campaign, line up the first 30%, listen to me and remember this. Line up the first 30%, email all those people that you know are gonna give it to you on day one, because those are the people you know before you start so that the day you launch, you get into 30% in your first like 24 or 48 hours and that is how you signal to the people who don't know you but might be interested in your campaign that you are not a creep. Also, on friends and family, remember, there's a whole lot of ways to raise money that have nothing to do with the web whatsoever. Oh, yeah, that. and, and that's how people start this usually, and it's friends and family. And the single best book ever written on this is Maury Warshawski's Shaking the Money Tree. And he tells you how to build your friends and family into a fundraising party <laughs> to raise money for your film. And everything he talks about that, which was actually written before the web existed, is still relevant today in how you think of building out a campaign. And I've seen filmmakers, even today with crowdfunding going on, that basically are just really popular bartenders and they know everyone in town and they get everyone to come to a really cool party and raise $100,000 for their movie without doing anything online. So it still works to raise it the old fashioned friends and family way as friends, well. Friends, family, and fools. Yeah. That's the important third <laughs> part. Yeah. Yes. Um, Congratulations. And I'm, I'm thinking about the third film, but now, you know, when I said second campaign, uh, I kind of turned to the same group of people that expanded, obviously, uh, because uh, probably 30% of those who financed the, um, the first film didn't finance the second one. But then 30% additionally came, came, came to the campaign, so I gave back to, to what I was. But um, when I'm thinking about the third Presum 
Presumably, you financed the film and it was made. Yes. And the people who funded it saw it. And then you financed the second film and it was made, and the people who funded it saw it. Yes. Now you have some group of people yeah, who yeah. totally trust you yeah, yeah. and don't go to them first for money. Ask them to share the campaign. You guys participated in the first two. You know that I will deliver on my promise. Can you go out to your community and tell them, this guy's trustworthy, because you are. But I'd also not be shy because those people are returning because they like your work yeah. and they want to support your work. So I think that's like bands aren't shy about going to their audience and saying, buy my new album, you know? And so it's like, that's what this is all about. Like finding people, finding people who like your work and having them, you know, in a sense, pre-support that work so it's created. So I wouldn't be- I just, would incentivize them. I would say, you know, I know who you are who supported me before. If you share information on this, you get a gift without money, and here's yeah. what it is. And if you do give on top of sharing the word, you get this extra thing. If yeah. you get an incentive because you're an ongoing supporter, you feel like you're part of a team, and you're part of someone who's helping get this made, and you're getting rewarded for helping. So I think yeah, giving incentives is better, the way to go. Treat your super fans better, you know, like. So theoretically, it should be even more successful. Yes. Theoretically, you've done two. I mean, that's pretty good. A lot of people can't get one done. I mean, it's really hard doing two. But especially, so I, I mean, I think the rule, you know, um, you may, correct me if I'm wrong, is at least eight months between campaigns, you know, maybe a year, you know. And the other thing is, are you keeping connection with them between? Like, if you're, you know, if you're email, if you're going through the the site and connecting with them and telling you what, telling them what's going on and keeping them engaged with you is also important. Oh, you're gonna, you're fine. Then good. You should get Stop a business worrying. card then later. You're doing, Let's talk. Then, yeah, then you're doing a good, then you're doing it well. So, you have time for one more question? Yeah. If you could give a single advice, single most essential thing you should do to increase your social capital, what would you say that? I, I'd go back to give way, way, way more than you ask. That would be mine. Shit, that's a good one. I, I would say it's what. Um, John say, said, actually, it's give more than you ask. If I have to add one, it would be be someone that people want to trust. I'm going to throw mine out there, which is uh, be sincere. You have to, it has to be not faking it. Not it has to be people can smell it. People can tell if you're if you're try, just trying to get something from them, or if you're just trying to pose as someone who's not trying to get something from them. It has to be. It really has to be real, and that's the thing I think people respond to the most. Well, given what they've said, I would say if you do ask, you better deliver on your promises. And I think that's all the time we have. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.